So today I'll talk about my work on bio-inspired design and building feathered morphing wing robots. So bio-inspired design starts with biology. And birds are pretty amazing creatures that can fly in just about that can fly better than just about anything their size, um, even including current aerial robots. So for example, here are some bald eagles that can fight and stay in flight. Um, and even less, com less complex wing motions, uh, such as this peregrine falcon and this pelican, what they can do is they can tuck their wings and dive at really high speeds. So this peregrine falcon um, can fly at speeds up to 200 miles per hour. And the pelican can tuck in its wings and grab fish from the air into the water uh, at, hi at heights up to like 60 feet. And swifts, these are birds that spend most of their lives in the air, and they can even sleep while flying, um, what they do is they can finely tune their wing shapes in order to get the optimal shape for different wind conditions. So these large wing shape changes is something that we can call uh, or can be described as wing morphing. And while wing morphing encompasses any large wing shape changes, my research focuses specifically on morphing wings that can extend and tuck during gliding flight. <coughs> And birds can easily outmaneuver current flying aerial robots. And we can compare the performance of birds with other winged robots of similar size um, using a five point scale. And so this is how falcons compare to, uh, say, a traditional quad rotor. Um, when we compare them for robustness, which is the ability to withstand collision, um, birds are much better at being able to hit things and carry on with their flight than quadcopters can. Um, also, adaptability, which is the ability to change shape. Um, in order to adapt to different wind conditions. And we can also compare them for flight speeds, uh, glide ratio, and also maneuverability, which uh, includes turn radiuses and turn speeds. And birds are fairly balanced across all five of these categories. Um, and when we compare them to similar robots, they generally exceed the performance of robots. And especially in those top two categories, the, the metrics of robustness to collision, as well as the adaptability of wing shapes. So by incorporating soft feathered morphing wings, maybe we can help design robots that can improve in these metrics. So um, I use biological measurements in order to understand how birds accomplish these wing morphing maneuvers. And then we can also apply that knowledge into designing robots. So in today's talk, I'll talk about how I took biological measurements um, in bird wings in order to design a morphing wing robot. So let's start with the biology um, and look at the pigeon wing anatomy. So in the avian wing, we have flight feathers that lie against two major bones in the wing. There's the ulna and the carpometacarpus. And then there's a wrist joint that lies between them, and it's actuated with, uh, with fast-acting striated muscles. So it's kind of different than our arms. Birds have most of their feathers lie between their hand and their arm, as opposed to having this additional joint here. And the primary feathers make up the hand wing, so these are the ones that are further out, and then there are secondary feathers that make up most of the arm wing, and this is what makes up the flying surfaces of a bird. Um, and then all of these flight feathers insert into a thick ligament um, that's called, uh, that lies along the postpatagium. In my biomechanical measurements, I define the wrist angle as the angle between the two bones, the ulna and the carpometacarpus, and then that's projected onto the, or that's on the feather plane. And the feather angles are defined as the angle between the, um, the feather and the, what it makes with the ulna. So for the secondary feathers, that's physically the angle between the bone and the feather since they attach. Um, but for the primary feathers, um, I project the axis of the feather as well as the ulna in order to get the effective angle between them. And this is just for measurement purposes, or for like modeling purposes. And in a wind tunnel study of gliding pigeons, um, done long ago by a scientist named Penny Quick, freely gliding pigeons uh, have been shown to glide in a wind tunnel and adapt, naturally adapt different postures at different speeds. And so what they tend to do is they like to tuck in at higher wind speeds in order to reduce the wing profile drag. Um, and then they extend their flights, uh, they extend their wings more at slower speeds in order to create more lift. Um, and so this ties back to that metric of adaptability of wing shapes to different wind conditions. And so from this study, we know that pigeons do that and they can adjust their planforms accordingly. 
And so how pigeons are able to achieve these uh, wing shapes is, is something that I wanted to investigate. And if we can find that mechanism, we can then apply it to designing bio-inspired robots, and we can help robots become more adaptable. So to get to robotic design, I first measure the biological mechanism that's happening within the wing that enables the pigeons to morph its wings. And then from there, I can create a model that can be translatable to the mechanics to building a robot. So in this experiment, I used a motion capture system in order to measure the um, locations of the bones within the wing as well as all of the feathers. So I've placed markers that are tracked um, that are, they're marker clusters um, that are inserted directly into the bone, which is why I use bird cadavers, because this is a pretty invasive, um, invasive procedure. And then I also place markers along every feather. So these are all 20 feathers, flight feathers within the wing. Um, and what I do is I match the motion of the wing to each of Penny Quick's flight, position, um, flight positions. And so here we see the wing fully extended with the primary and secondary feathers in that like, fully extended position. Um, we can also pose the, the wing into the mid-tucked position, um, as well as the fully tucked position. Um, and I can track the motion of that. But beyond just these three poses, we are also really interested in the continuous motion. Um, the ability of the bird to flow seamlessly across all of these poses and adjust um, instead of three discrete poses. So I animate the wing through its full range of motion, all the way from flexion to extension. And I'm measuring the position of the bones and all the feathers as I do this. And I take measurements of three different individuals with 12 cycles each. And from here, we can calculate the motion of all the bones and the feathers. So from these measurements, I can plot the wrist angle, which is the input angle, um, on the x-axis. And then I have the measured feather angle along the y-axis. Um, and so plotted here is the average and the standard deviation for the feather S10, which is the one closest to the body. I track all 20 flight feathers within a wing, but here I'll plot just a sampling across the wings. So here you see S5, which is a middle secondary feather. Um, this is P1, which is uh, a wrist, a feather within the wrist. Um, there's P5, which is a mid primary feather, and then the farthest wingtip feather is P10. And so with these data, we can show, we can see that the relationship between the wrist angle and the feather angle is fairly linear. So I use a least squares fit to find a linear transfer function in order to mathematically map what the predicted feather angle would be for a given wrist angle input. Um, and since each one of these feathers is um, only a function of the wrist angle, we can think about the entire wing as a system that is underactuated. So just by actuating the wrist angle, we can control the motion of all the feathers within a wing. We can also, and another thing is that these are data from both flexion and extension, and so there's no hysteresis, meaning that even when the bird opens and closes its wings, the feathers move kind of along the same path in both directions. And we can plot the slopes of this function, of these functions. And we can think about the slopes as a sensitivity to the wrist angle. So depending on how much the wrist angle moves will affect how much the feathers move. So feathers closer to the body have a slope of less than one, so they don't move as much when the wrist angle moves, um, which intuitively makes sense. And the distal tip feathers, the ones furthest out, have a really wide range of angles, and they'll move a lot compared to what the wrist angle. Um, so from these linear transfer functions derived from the, kinematic um, from the kinematic measurements, we can now model the motion of underactuated feathers. And I can use this linear model to create uh, kind of a stick animation of the wing. And you can think of this as a rough prototype that lays out the, the robotic mechanism of how to build an underactuated wing. And so here's a little animation where I have the ulna, the, the purple lines representing the bone, or the ulna and the carpal metacarpus. Um, in this case, I also include a finger joint. Um, and this finger joint enables that wider spread of a fully extended wing. Um, but here, I have the finger coordinated with the wrist. So really, it's just the wrist as an input angle. Um, and then I can predict where the feathers will be for every input wrist angle because of the measurements that I made in those linear, um, the linear transfer functions. And so here you can see this animated model of how the feathers should flow at, at every um, input wrist angle. And so this is kind of like the first step to helping me design a robotic wing.
But these functions describe how the feathers move within our wing. It doesn't necessarily dig into why or how we would actually go about building something that moves like this. So to understand the implementation of underactuation, underactuated motion, I go back to the anatomy. So remember that ligament, an involuntary smooth muscle that lies, that like lies between each of the feathers? So we can translate that biology into a mechanical design, and I approximate this as a series of linear springs that uh, weave in between each of the feathers. And to test this approximation, I created a model with linear elastic springs between each flight feather. And I assume that the flexion extension happens only within the plane of the wing, that the feathers are each attached to the bone via a frictionless pin joint, so they only have one degree of freedom um, rotating in that plane. Um, and the distance at the spring attachment is estimated from uh, biological measurements. And additionally, that the, the springs all have a bit of pretension, even in that tucked flying position. So that means that they're still holding out their wings in that tucked position, as opposed to completely relaxed when they're like walking around with their wings tucked in. Um, and now I also assume that the furthest, uh, the furthest wingtip feather is rigidly attached to the bone, and, when, and in biology it really is, the bone kind of fuses around that last feather, and that the, um, the normalized force, the force that it takes for the bird to stretch out and extend its wings, is acting perpendicular onto that last feather. Um, and then for the other boundary condition closer to the body, um, there's a lot of other smaller feathers here, and so I model that end spring attachment as a moving one, moving as the average of the feathers next to it. Um, so I also assume that morphing is quasi-static, so at every wrist angle, the, feather, um, the feathers aren't moving, they're kind of static at each wrist angle. And so for the linear model, I know the position of every single feather for a given wrist angle. And I can also assume that the sum of the moments around that feather is zero. And so I can solve for the stiffness of each of the springs because I know that the springs oppose each other within the feather and they sum to zero. Um, so doing this calculation, so this is an example of um, one feather, but if you do this as a system of equations across all 20 feathers, I can set up a matrix equation that allows me to solve for all the different spring stiffnesses, K, for each pose. And I can do this for each of the wrist angles um, and then predict what the average uh, stiffness should be between each of the feathers. Um, so you can see this plotted here. The bar chart shows the relative stiffness of the spring between each feather for um, each of the feathers. And this is averaged across 151 different wrist angle poses. Um, and you can think of like the feather positions as the nodes of the springs, um, as the springs are stretched from end to end. And here you can see that the lowest stiffness is between the wrist angles, so between P1 and S1. Um, and this makes sense because that's where the feathers separate a lot, and you expect to have something that's less stiff to allow the birds to, to really stretch in that, in that area. And then the stiffnesses are really high at the wing tip feathers, which also makes sense because you don't want the feathers separating when you have um, high wind conditions. So you actually want the tip feathers to be much more stiff. And so now that we can model the kinematics, or the motion of the center shaft of the feathers, let's take a closer look at the feather surfaces. Um, and that's mostly because it's the feather surfaces that make up the surface of the wing. And that is the lifting, um, what provides lift for the birds as they fly. So in order to maintain a continuous wing, uh, the feathers overlap. And so in a way that the outermost feather lies under the next. Um, and so you can see that in the cross-sectional view on the bottom right, kind of with the, the circles represent the rachis, so that center shaft, and then the veins that tuck um, under the next feather. And that means that under aerodynamic loading, um, the bottom feather pushes up against its inner neighbor, and so then it's in contact to create a continuous surface. And this is true all the way across the wing, where the tip feathers nestle under the next all the way down until the closest one to the body. And so therefore, all the feathers are uh, continually in contact with each other. And they actually slide against each other as the bird is morphing its wings while it's flying. So it seems that feathers and their feather surfaces are important things to look at. So since feathers are the building blocks of a bird wing, um, I wanted to take a closer look to kind of understand what makes them so special. So feathers are made up of keratin proteins, which is the same as your hair. Um, but while hair is normally just a single strand, feathers are actually highly hierarchical in their structure. So here you can see a feather where you have the main central shaft, which is the rachis, 
And then there's these soft veins on either side, and that's what creates the, the aerodynamic surfaces. Um, but if you zoom in, you can see that um, zooming into this section, you see that central, uh, central rachis again. And then now you can see closer that the veins are actually made up um, of, of a bunch of barbs that are stitched next to each other. And zooming into that, you can see that each barb has a stiff center ramus, um, and then they have branching barbules that branch off of that. Um, and zooming into that some more, so you can see exactly how hierarchical these feathers are, um, that the barbules themselves also have these branching structures called cilia. And now we're really into the micro scale. And so in these branching cilia, there are some that stick up and out of plane, and that's what interacts with the neighboring feathers. And so we can see how they interact by taking CT scans of hooked adjacent feathers. And so this is a CT scan. Um, this is a 3D rendering of that CT scan as we're looking down. And you can see how the P5 feather overlaps um, the P6 feather. And if you take a cross-sectional view of that 3D rendering, um, you can see kind of that mi those microstructures interacting. Um, and so there's some bottom rami that are like hooked down, and then there's these out-of-plane microstructures that, well, you really can't see in this view because the resolution of the CT scanner isn't quite good enough. Um, so to solve that problem, we zoom in some more and looking at each of the individual feathers. Um, and this way we can get better resolution. And so I worked with collaborator Teresa Feo, who uh, imaged individual feathers using a high energy beamline CT scanner at Argonne National Laboratories. And she took small sections of individual feathers in order to get that, um, in order to find the resolution to figure out what the shape of those microstructures really are like. So now you can see clearly that there's this hooked bottom edge of the ramus that locks onto the lobate cilia that stick up and out of plane. Um, and we can render these structures into 3D forms. Um, and you can see how they interact. Um, so you have that lobate cilia that really is a hook that sticks up and out of plane, and then the ramus that will scoop in and interact. And we can also use scanning electron microscopy in order to look down and see what the surface of the structures are like. Um, so now we can see them from the top view looking down, um, as well as zooming out, we can see that there's actually a field of them within the feather surface. Um, and so you can think of these as a bunch of hooklets um, kind of interacting with the top hooked rami. And so these are kind of like probabilistic fasteners or something that you're, you're more familiar with is more like Velcro. So the surfaces of the feathers and how these special micro, microstructures um, cause them to, when they interact with each other, to hook together and moving and they stick like Velcro. Um, so we've dove really far deep into the microstructure. So let's, let's come back out and try to figure out like, how that affects the, the feathers interacting themselves. Um, so in order to test how these microstructures affect the behavior of feathers sliding next to each other, um, I do this experiment where I pull feathers apart in, in four different directions, so in flexion and extension, so the usual extend and tuck positions, and as well as just to, to be thorough to test the surfaces moving in the anterior and posterior direction. Um, and so here um, is a video of separating feathers as they pull apart, and you can really see that sticking mechanism happening. Um, and that's what keeps the feathers together and from, falling, from pulling apart when the bird extends its wings. And so you see the forces opposing that motion are really high. And now here's flexion, which is tucking the wings in. Um, and so they slide with really low forces. And same for testing in the posterior and anterior direction. And so what we found that not only do feather microstructures have, um, have kind of this probabilistic fasting like Velcro, it's also highly directional, which is pretty unique. And so, therefore, the birds are able to keep their feathers from separating apart when, or they, they're able to prevent their feathers from separating when they're extending their wings during flight. So let's go back to robotic design. So from the biological measurements of the feather kinematics, we developed a linear spring model in order, and this helps us design a mechanism to build into a robot that can actuate, um, that can enable the wings to actuate all the feathers in an underactuated way. And from diving really deep into the feather microstructures and learning about directional probabilistic fastening, we also realized that feathers are really unique, micro are really unique structures that we can't fully repli replicate artificially. And so this is a big motivation for us to design these biohybrid wings, so using the feathers in our robotic design.
Um, so for our, robotic, for our robotic wing, we use these real bird feathers. Um, and here, this is how we built our robotic wing. So we have an active skeleton, and this skeleton structure is based off of the shape and motion of the bones. Um, and it's actuated by two servos that can control the wrist angle as well as the finger angle. And these servo-powered skeletons control, um, so it's mimicked off the, the skeleton, and then it controls the wrist and the finger angle. Um, and then we also have a series of these elastic bands. And so this is what we're trying to, this is what we implemented from the kinematic measurements. And each elastic band is tuned based off the stiffnesses that was calculated. Um, and they, they mimic the same, the, same, um, the same stiffnesses. We also use real fit, uh, pigeon feathers in order to capture that same property of feathers being able to slide against each other and to hook only during extension. And so together, the active skeleton and the elastic ligaments enable the underactuation of the wing. And so here you can see the robotic wing morphing continuously as we, activate, as we actuate just the wrist and the finger angles. So with this wing, we can test permutations that aren't practical to do with real birds. So I wanted to ask some questions. For example, how does the wing perform under aerodynamic loading? And what are the roles of the elasticity and feather contact? Like, is it really necessary to have both? Um, and what does that look like when a, when a bird wing is actually <coughs> aerodynamically loaded? So to answer these questions, we place our wing into a wind tunnel. Um, and here you're looking at the test section with the wind blowing from left to right. And the wing is mounted on a splitter plate at 10 degrees of an angle attack, which is similar to what pigeons do when they're flying. We have a camera underneath that films kind of like the belly up view, so you would see like a bird flying overhead. And then additionally, we have um, a turbulence grid that is upstream of the test section. And so this has the spinning vanes that can create a turbulent, um, different turbulence profiles. So that way we can test the wing in both laminar flow or low turbulence and also high turbulence intensities. So to understand the effects of the elasticity and feather contact um, under aerodynamic loading, I test different permutations of the robot. So first I have the original um, feather contact where all the feathers are nestled against each other. And then we also created a different robot in which we slightly spaced out the feathers so they don't come into contact with each other. We also have different permutations where the elasticity are all in place um, and the elastic bands are intact, as well as removing them and just seeing what that happens. And so here are um, images of the wing under aerodynamic loading in the fully outstretched, um, outstretched position. And you can see that you really do need both the feather contact and the elastic ligaments um, in order to create a seamless wing. And as soon as you remove contact between the feathers, gaps start to form between them. And so it really is that fastening is really necessary to keep the feathers together under aerodynamic loading. Um, and interestingly, if you remove the elastic bands but keep the, feather, um, keep the feathers in contact, you can see that they tend to stay together, um, but when you have uh, at the tip feathers where you're opposing the wind, the, um, elastic, the fastening between feathers isn't high enough, so that's where the elasticity comes into play. And then, of course, if you don't have feather contact or elastic bands, they really, don't, they really don't stay into a wing. Um, and so here is an image of all these different permutations of the wing morphs within, um, within a wind tunnel. And you can really see the gaps that start to form between the feathers when there's no contact, um, and as well as the feathers kind of sticking together when um, there's feather contact but no elasticity shows even bigger gaps between them. We can also repeat the same four permutations in turbulent flow. Um, and once again, it really is only the wing that has both the feather contact and elastic bands intact that stay uh, a continuous wing. So we know that both of these things are important when we design, when we design a robot. Um, and here you can see in that turbulent wind um, and the effects of, of these different permutations are a lot more, a lot more prominent. And so, once again, it really is, um, in order to morph successfully, we have to have the elastic ligaments as well as the feather contact coming into contact. Um, 
And so to get a quantitative measure of the feather motion of our robot, we use image processing um, in order to track the feather and wrist angles as the wing morphs. And so the wrist angle is calculated from those purple um, lines, and, that's, um, and then the colored rectangular markers that you see are tracking um, markers that are placed on each of the feathers, and we can get the angles, um, we can measure the angles of each of the feathers within the robotic wing. And so we can, see, we can plot once again that feather angle along the y-axis as well as uh, the input wrist angle along the x-axis. Um, and this is a more quantitative measure of what you could see the effects in, in the video. So when all the lines are kind of equally spaced with um, non-zero slope, you can see that the feathers are well coordinated. Um, kind of like in the case we have both feather contact and elastic bands. When you see the zero slope, so kind of along the bottom, that means that the feathers just aren't moving when the wrist is moving. And when there's gaps between in the slope, there's like differences between the slopes that shows the gaps that happen between each of the feathers. And so we know that we need both elastic and feather contact in order to have a continuous wing plan form. So after wind tunnel testing, um, we built a full morphing robotic wing, um, and we were able to test it in outdoor flight testing and morph the, actively morph the wings. And so the wing is mounted on a traditional RC fuselage with a propeller that provides thrust. Um, and the biohybrid robot successfully flies outdoors as it morphs its wings from the tucked position to a fully extended position. So in this video, the robot is teleoperated by an operator, but we also have an onboard um, autopilot as well as a, a suite of different sensors so we can do different controls testing on it as well. Um, and we'll be also live stream the data from here to a computer ground station um, as we're tracking the flight. Yeah? How do you control roll? Uh, so we, can, we have a traditional tail right now, and so there's a, there's, mm, we can also, for, let's see, we have traditional tail, so that's elevator pitch, and then there's yaw, and then for roll we can control like asymmetrically, tucking um, each wing. But yeah, we don't have the traditional ailerons that control roll. And <coughs> birds don't either. So, <laughs> so the in-flight gliding positions of our robot, we're able to replicate the same positions that were measured by Penny Quick for the gliding pigeons. So here you see the comparison for the um, fully extended wing, um, as well as a mid-tuck position and a fully tucked position. And this is also, um, these are three discrete points, but we can also continuously morph just like birds between all of these positions. So the choice of a pigeon as a model animal comes from the fact that they're kind of a generalist bird. Um, and they're actually like surprisingly good at flying in cluttered environments and surviving in places you wouldn't expect birds to survive. Um, and you can really see, find them thriving just about anywhere. But there are over 9,000 different species of birds. Um, and each one has really different flight adaptations. So could we use the same bio-inspired design rules in order to design, um, if that we, we discovered for a pigeon robot, in order to design robots that are more like other species? So we could maybe include flight, flight adaptations, perhaps be inspired by the California condor and they're really good at gliding, or maybe by owls that are silent flyers. So, um, I took the barn owl as a case study in order to test the robotic design principles that we found from a pigeon. And so I apply the same underactuated design, but um, adapt it for the owl morphology. So it's a different um, bone shape and a different, um, different size scale. So owls are a little bit bigger. And we also adapted it to, to um, use owl feathers. And so as you see here, we can use the same principles and the same design mechanism in order to create a wing that can morph just as seamlessly as the pigeons. So to design bio-inspired uh, feathered morphing wings, I started with the kinematic measurements of feathers um, and also the bones within a wing and then determined, kind of diving deep into the microstructures, determining what the feather surfaces were like. Um, and from there, we were able to combine those principles from biology to design a morphed wing feathered robotic, uh, robotic bird. Um, and so putting that all together, um, 
we can design, we can go from biology to robots, but kind of another exciting thing is that from robotics, we can also learn a lot about biology. So not only can biology inform robotics, um, robots can also help us figure out and answer questions that we didn't know in biology that we couldn't necessarily test with real animals. Um, so with that, I'd like to conclude and also uh, acknowledge my collaborators and my, my lab mates, um, Amanda Sowers, Eric Chang, Lindsay Jeffries, Teresa Feo, as well as my PhD advisor, David Lentink. Um, and I'll stop here and take questions. Yeah. Uh, I think it's really cool that you guys should be using like the actual feathers in the robot. Uh, but I guess, uh, do you think there's also any further research that'll be done to try to mimic those feathers, like with like materials, or so we can get that kind of class arrangement? And um, yeah, yeah, we see like uh, you guys going yeah. from here. Yeah, definitely for sure. So I think kind of from knowing this design, we can also. Um, apply different artificial feather manufacturing methods. So I've actually explored making carbon fiber feathers and things like that, but if you remember the structures of the feathers, they have this ability to be really stiff as well as really soft and nestle against each other. And so with carbon fiber, we run into the, the problem of them not being able to press against each other because they're too stiff. Um, so I think there's a kind of big open field to creating artificial feathers and there's a lot of cool things that we could do. Yeah. I think in a very impressive deep dive into the functions of the wing and how they're structured. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you explored at all the relevance of the structure of the bone. So mm -hmm. you know, there's the geometry of the bone, but also like the properties and the weight associated with it. Does mm -hmm. that seem to make a crucial difference in terms of whether you're actually able to replicate the behavior of a bird wing? Yeah, there's actually a lot of studies have gone way into like, you know, how bones uh, bird bones are really different, how they're hollow and they're good at resisting torsion and things like that. Um, another lab mate of mine has looked at the different mechanisms in the like, joints, so like a four bar, a six bar mechanism to replicate how the bird um, skeleton moves. For me, I was focused mostly on the feathers, so I like simplify all the bone into just moving in as a wrist angle. Um, but that definitely is um, definitely is a direction we can go. I think a lot of our engin engineering materials are good at replicating bone. Um, like the 3D printed parts that we have here, and it's a more simple structure than the, the feathers are. Yeah. With the uh, owl and the pigeon model, the, uh, the tensions, or not the tensions, the elas el elasticity of mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, those values, are, they, are you using the same, or did you do a comparison between what the pigeon model preferred for the elasticity and then the, uh, Owl. Yeah, um, so owls actually have two more secondary feathers, and in this case, I used kind of the pigeon as a template and then adjusted as we went. So each one of those elastic bands have um, like different stiffnesses, they're like different diameters or different thicknesses. And so I started with the, owl, the pigeon values as a template and then swapped them out when it looked like they were gappy or not moving fluidly. So, follow up to yeah. that. The, uh, I think it was like the S6. Uh -huh. One was like had almost no error to the measurement. Mm -hmm. Is that was that consistent with the owl as well? And if so, is there do you have any insight on why that one was so so much more precise? I think so. We didn't do the biomechanical measurements on the owls, and so I think the idea is that if we do this really in-depth study on pigeons, can we then translate the learning to other species without having to go do these biomechanical measurements? Um, and it's easier to do these measurements on pigeons than it is on owls. Um, and so for S6, the, like, the preciseness, I think it just happens to be, um, yeah, I'm not sure why it's particularly more precise in that, in that case. It could be from the three individuals that I initially measured. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't focus specifically on that. Yes, thank you. Do you have a sense of uh, the, the wing weight compared to a traditional wing that has bars and ribs? And yeah, um, because we use the like 3D printed bone mechanism as well as putting the actuators on the wing itself, uh, it tends to be a little bit heavier in the skeleton section, but then since we're using feathers, which are really lightweight, um, I think it tends to be a little bit heavier because the actuation happens directly on the wing as opposed to when you have like 
the servos in the fuselage and bars coming out. Yeah. Maybe I'll go to the last one. Uh, oh, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> do you think you guys can do thrust with the wings eventually? or? So, yeah, so I guess birds naturally provide their own thrust from their wings because they flap their wings, and adding flapping wings is um, like a whole other mechanism you have to add on top of that. And I think eventually it would be something we could do, and that's kind of like in the shoulder joints um, and having, you know, the power within the fuselage. So I think that would be a really cool direction, um, but certainly a whole other PhD project. <laughs> well, Great, well, thank you.